Namaste Sarasati Deve Kauravani Pracharine Nirvisesha Shamyavadi Paschatya Desatarine Vanchakaupata Rubyasya Kripa Sindhu Bhayevacha Patitanam Pavanebhyo Vaishnavibhyo Namo Namaha Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadha Shri Vasadi Gaur Bhakta Vinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama Rama Rama, Rama Hare Hare All right, so we were still finishing the purport of mantra number 11, right? We're here studying the Ishopanishad at the level of Bhakti Shastri. And in the last class, we were looking at mantra number 11. We're nearly completed the purport. So we will just begin by reciting that mantra. Someone would like to chant for us? Someone would like to lead the chanting? Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes, Hare. Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Can you read Maharaj? Vidyam cha avidyam cha yas. Vidyam avidyam cha yas. Vidyam cha yas. Tat vedho vyam saha. Advedo Vyam Saha Avidyaya Avidyam Tirtva Avidyaya Amardam Asmite You can read the translation, Prabhu. Hare Krishna. One who can learn the process of nescience and that of the transcendental knowledge side by side can transcend the influence of repeated birth and death and enjoy the full blessings of immortality. Okay. So we're going to... Uh, we're discussing about the importance, the balance between the material and the spiritual. So this verse brings out that need for a balance, that we cannot neglect material knowledge. We have to also cultivate knowledge of the material world, proper knowledge, how to live in this world. But at the same time, we shouldn't become too much affected by the material world. We shouldn't become too much absorbed in this material energy. But we do have to know something about the material world the nature of the material body. We have to know how to be able to take care of it. All of this is important. So we have to have, we have to culture both vidya and avidya. Sometimes people misunderstand and they think this means we should go out and enjoy the material world. Sometimes people even argue, they say that, uh, let, let me enjoy the material world first. Then I'll become a devotee after I've enjoyed the material world. So when Prabhupada heard this, he said that would mean the pig will be the best devotee. Because the pigs are enjoying, they're having maximum sense gratification, filling their bellies and satisfying their genital. In this way, they're, they're, they're very happy. But of course, we, we don't see pigs becoming devotees. So foolish people argue like this. They have so many foolish arguments why they don't want to surrender to Krishna. And so this is the nature of the avidya potency that covers up their intelligence. 
they cannot understand the real goal of life. All right, so uh, Prabhupada was explaining to us in his purport how uh, the aim of Vidya, just wait, let me see here. The guaranteed path to the aim of Vidya is described by Rupa Goswami in Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu, which we have presented. As in, in English, nectar of devotion, the culture of Vidya is summarized in Srimad Bhagavatam in the following words. Tasmadekena manasa bhagavan tadvatam pati shrotavya kirtitavyascha dhyaya pujas chanityada. Therefore, with one pointed attention, one should constantly hear about, glorify, remember, and worship the personality of Godhead, who is the protector of the devotees. Unless religion, economic development, and sense gratification aim towards the attainment of devotional service to the Lord, they are all simply different forms of neshines, as Sri Shopanishad indicates in the following mantras. <laughs> so, we, of course, we are going to hear a few more mantras in this regard. So, Prabhupada is pointing out there's no harm in sense gratification, religion, economic development. These things are, it's not that they're unnecessary. There's no harm in these things, but they should help us. It, it, it become, they become perfect when they're able to help us to develop our Krishna consciousness. If they help us to become more devoted to the Supreme Lord, then it's good. But without Krishna consciousness, just like Srimad Bhagavatam says, duties executed by all men are only useless labor if they don't provoke attraction for the personality of Godhead. So it just become useless labor. We don't get any real benefit from it. Some temporary benefit, some flickering pleasure, some temporary enjoyment in the material world. But it's all temporary. It's a, a waste of time. So this is the point. Therefore, we have to cultivate both the vidya and the avidya. Unfortunately, very less people are cultivating vidya. Everyone's so busy in the path of sense gratification and economic development and other things. So this is all nations. Okay, we'll go ahead. Are, are there any questions on this, th those group of texts? That's at nine, uh, 10, 9, 10 and 11, all co covered the culture of knowledge and nations. Any questions on them at all? If there are no questions, we'll move ahead to Mantra 12. Prabhu, would you like to chant for us again, Prabhu, the person who chanted before? Hare Krishna Maharaj. Verse number 12. Andam tama pravishyanti. Andam tama pravishyanti. Ye asambhudam upasate. Ye asambhutim upasate. Tato buya yivate tamo. Tato buya yivate tamo. Yayu samputyam rataha. Yayu samputyam rataha. And read the translation. Those who are engaged in the worship of demigods enter into the darkest region of ignorance and still more so do the worshippers of the impersonal absolute. So after hearing about culture of knowledge diff and different group degrees, now we're going to hear about worship, worship of the absolute and worship of the relative will be compared. Would you like to go ahead, Prabhu, and, and read the first paragraph? Hare Krishna Maharaj, purport. The Sanskrit word, Asambhuti refers to those who have no independent existence. Sambhuti is the absolute personality of Godhead. 
who is absolutely independent of everything. In the Bhagavad Gita 10.2, the absolute personality of Godhead, Sri Krishna states, Name vidu suragana prabhavam na magashya aham adhirhi devanam magashi cha sarvashaka. Neither the host of demigod nor great sages know my origin or opulence. For in every respect, I am the source of the demigods and sages. Thus, Krishna is the origin of the powers delegated to demigods, great sages and mystics. Although they are endowed with great powers, these powers are limited. And thus, it is very difficult for them to know how Krishna himself appears by his own internal potency in the form of a man. Thank you. So, how many demigods are there? Do you remember? 33 crores. Right, yes. And here we, we hear Prabhupada quoting this verse from the Bhagavad Gita, how even the demigods and the great sages, that they cannot understand Krishna. Krishna's beyond their understanding because he's the source of the demigods and sages. Just like the young child comes to the parents and they want to understand, where do I come from? <laughs> now, what can the child understand? And so in the same way, the demigods and the great sages, they try to understand Krishna, but Krishna is beyond their understanding also. Because Krishna is the Supreme Lord, the Lord of everything. So his Prabhupada introduces this word, Asambhuti, no independent existence, and Sambhuti. Sambhuti meaning Krishna, the absolute personality of Godhead. He is completely independent of everything. Hmm? And first verse of Srimad Bhagavatam is also mentioned how the Lord is fully independent. We are not, we are fully dependent. We're dependent on so many things in the material energy. But Krishna is the origin of all of these things. So although the great sages are very powerful, their power is limited. And Krishna himself appears by his own internal potency in the form of a man. So what does Krishna say in the Bhagavad Gita about that? How does it affect people? Because he's coming in the form of a man. Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita, Naham Prakasha Sarvasya Yoga Maya Samarat Modoyam Abhijanatin Marajasman. Well, here we see Krishna is manifest. But what's happening? Krishna is appearing as a man. But what's happening? What are people thinking? I think it's normal person. He's under yes. the illusion. Yes. They're thinking he's an ordinary person, right? Yes. Ordinary people, what happens to them? They're under illusion, as you say. Also, what happens? They grow old, they get disease, and they die. Right? But Krishna said, no, no, I am never man. Krishna says, the foolish mock at me, descending amongst them like a human being. You know the rest of that verse? I forgot Maharaj. Anybody know? The foolish mock at me, descending amongst them like a human being. They do not know. Do Anybody? They do not know my transcendental nature and my supreme dominion over all that be. 
ஜன்மனாஜிஸ்டுமி So he is Mahatma. Well, yes, but usually this we use this verse to indicate the process of knowledge. That by the process of knowledge, one can come to understand Krishna. One who is actually knowledge, like the goal of knowledge. One who is actually in knowledge surrenders to me. So. Generally, we will use that verse in that manner. Maharaj, is it Aham Sarvasya Prabhu, Matta Sarva Pravartate? Aham Sarvasya Prabhu, Matta Sarva Pravartate, Iti Matva Bhajante Ma, Buddha Bhava Samanvita. Aham Sarvasya Prabhu. what is the tra- that meaning that uh, i am never manifest to the foolish and the unintelligent for, for them i am covered by my yoga maya right yes so that verse is describing krishna doesn't doesn't reveal himself to, he only reveals himself to devotees he doesn't reveal himself to the foolish and the unintelligent so yeah in some way it's all right it's a suitable verse because they think krishna is an ordinary man but maharaj hari krishna maharaj yes avajananti ma mudha manushitanu maashritu param bhavam ajananto mama bhutva maheshwaram Uh, uh-huh. 9.11 shloka marriage foolish deride me when i descend in the human form they do not know my transcendental nature as the supreme lord of all that we thank you yes right so yeah they don't know my transcendental nature they think krishna says they think i'm just an ordinary person. but actually what's happening krishna is appearing in his own spiritual body He, does, he doesn't grow old although he was in the world more than 100 years he didn't grow old he's still like a young man and his birth was not at all ordinary very special birth in the course of his life he performed so many wonderful activities different leelas and at the end when he completed this pastimes then he arranged a special trick to fool the the non believers to fool the atheists he arranged to leave a false a, a maya form just like when ravan kidnapped mother sita ravan actually didn't take mother sita but he took a maya sita an illusory form of mother sita Mother Sita is the goddess of fortune and she could never be touched by a demon like Ravan but the lord arranged a maya form of sita to be taken away by Ravan and similarly when krishna departed from this world you know krishna they, they say oh he got hit in the foot by an arrow can somebody get hit in the foot is it going to kill them you know we never heard of this you know you get hit in the foot going to kill so very it's all very strange but it was krishna's trick he left a maya form to fool the atheists and people will say this is krishna's this is where krishna's body was cremated and his ashes are here and like this of so, all foolish people they don't understand the transcendental nature of krishna that he appears in his transcendental form okay we'll go ahead 
someone else like to read, please? Ranut Pranam Maharaj. Yes, Hare Krishna, go ahead. Many philosophers and great rishis or mystics try to distinguish and the absolute form, the relative by their tiny brain power. This can only help them reach the negative conception of the absolute without realizing any positive trace of the absolute. Definition of the absolute by negation is not complete. Such negative definitions lead one to create a concept of one's own. Thus, one imagines that the absolute must be formless and without qualities. Such negative qualities are simply the reversals of relative material qualities and are therefore also relative. By conceiving of absolute in this way, one can at the utmost reach the impersonal effusions of God, known as Brahman. But one cannot make further progress to Bhagavan, the personality of Godhead. Hare Krishna. Thank you. Okay, so we're hearing about different ways of understanding God. And Prabhupada talks, philosophers, great mystics, they distinguish the absolute from the relative. The absolute, who is that absolute? This concept of Krishna. Yes, Lord Sri Krishna, the absolute. Prabhupada in the, if you look in the uh, preface or introduction there of the Srimad Bhagavatam, Prabhupada speaks about the absolute truth. He explains the concept of the absolute is higher than the concept of the simply God. Because if you speak about God, then there's so many gods. There's the God of rain, there's the God of wind, there's the God of fire, there's the God of wealth. You know, we have so many gods. But there's only one absolute truth. Therefore, Lord Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, There is no truth superior to me. Everything rests on me just like, who knows? It's Somebody time. can... Huh? It's time. Like a a the yes, Thank you, Madhiji. Yes, perils are strung on a thread. Thank you, Madhiji. Now, so that's the example Krishna gives. So Krishna says, there's no truth superior to me. Nobody else ever says that. Lord Shiva never says that. Lord Brahma never says that. Ganesh never says that. Durga never says that. There are so many gods. There's only one supreme God above everyone. Lord Krishna says that himself in the Bhagavad Gita, a very powerful statement there. So Krishna is the absolute truth, but people try to understand the absolute. The, how do they try to understand? Without realizing any trace of the absolute. They, what do they do? They, they have this, they try to understand the absolute truth by the negative conception. They say, God cannot be, he cannot have a form. Why? Because I have a form. So if God has a form, he must be like me. God cannot, he cannot be a person because I'm a person. So if God is a person, he must be a person like me. He must be also imperfect. So they, they think like that. They try to apply that kind of thinking to understanding God. So you can never understand God in that way. This is called the process of negation. And that is why you hear so many of these statements, you know, that God has no form, he has no arms, he has no legs, he cannot see, he cannot hear. Oh, so they think God is deaf, God is dumb, God is blind, God is lame. They're thinking like this, this is their offense. You see, when you try to understand God with our limited thinking, then we'll never be successful. So the definition of the absolute by negation will never 
be successful. Yes, God is not a person, not a person like us, but he is a person. But not like we are a person. He's not a limited person. He's a perfect person. We are imperfect. So negative definitions lead one to create a concept of our own. People imagine God. They have their own ideas about God. Oh, God is light. God is, God is energy. This is how they understand God. And they think, oh, he cannot have qualities because if he has qualities, they must be imperfect. So all of these ways of thinking like this, this is all the negation which is done by Mayavadis. Trying to understand God in this way will always be a failure. And at the best, the very best result they can get is they could go to the impersonal Brahman, up to the Brahma Jyoti. But they could never properly understand the real conception of God beyond their brain. Okay, we'll go ahead. Another, another man can read, please. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Such, such mental speculators do not know that the absolute personality of Godhead is Krishna, that the impersonal Brahma is the glaring effulgence of his transcendental body, or that the Paramatma, the super soul, is his all pervading plenary representation. Nor do they know that Krishna has his eternal form with his transcendental qualities of eternal bliss and knowledge. The dependent demigods and great sages imperfectly consider him to be a powerful demigod and they consider the Brahma emergence, effulgence to be the absolute truth. But the devotees of Krishna, by dint of their surrendering unto him and their unalloyed devotion, can know that he is the absolute person and that everything emanates from him. Such devotees continuously render loving service unto Krishna the fountainhead of everything. Thank you. So Prabhu, you can tell me what are the different phases of different ways in which we can understand the absolute truth? How do we, how, what are the different realizations? Generally, there are three levels of realization. Do you know what they are? The by self-realization, uh, Maharaj, by first... Sorry? Level. By realizing self. Yes, we Paramatma, want to... That Paramatma, the Krishna is there in our heart. So that is the first realization we should do. Well, we want to understand God. Yes, Mother. The absolute truth. Different, three different levels of realization of God is the absolute truth. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes. Yeah, it is the Bhagavatam Shloka which can be defined. Vadanti tat tatva vidas tatva magyana matvayam brahmeti paramatmeti bhagwaniti shabdyati. Yes. Thank you very much. Can you give the translation? Yeah. So the knowers of the truth hereby declare that uh, uh, there are uh, the, uh, the absolute truth can be realized in three different three stages. Uh, the first one is Brahman, which is uh, the uh, uh, formless uh, realization, which is the effulgence of the Lord Himself. Is... Okay, so this Brahman realization is realization of what potency of the Lord? Uh, the Sat. Sat, yes. yes. Sat, right. Meaning eternality. Yes. Eternal, yes. Go ahead. And then? Uh, then the second stage is the Paramatma realization. Yes. Uh, uh, so, which is the, uh, that the Paramatma has a shape. So, you know, that, that indicates that Paramatma has a shape and it is uh, uh, situated in everybody's heart. As, and the third, uh, the highest stage of realization is Bhagwan, where uh, he, he is there with, uh, uh, the Absolute is there with all his potencies. All his all right. potencies. So, can uh, is Paramatma, what realization of the potency of the Lord is that? Yeah, it is the um, 
Chit, right. Knowledge potency, right. Yes, yes. And then, and then Bhagavan? Sachidananda. Okay. So, the Lord is Brahman, Paramatma, and Bhagavan. So, can we worship the Brahman? Can we co worship the, the Brahman and the Paramatma like we worship Bhagavan? Maharaj, uh, like the, when, uh, when the, the uh, uh, it is always uh, like when we know that uh, the Lord has a form and it, uh, he is uh, there with all his potencies, we should worship uh, the Lord in, with his all full potencies, which is uh, the Bhagavan himself. So people do, uh, but that is the first and second stage of realization. If people are doing it on Brahman and Paramatma, then that is the stage of realization which they are. Once we understand the knowledge, we should uh, worship the highest uh, stage, which is the Bhagavan's. Yes, we should understand if you're going to worship the Brahman and the Paramatma, you're not going to get any Ananda. The Ananda only comes in worship of the Bhagavan. There's no bliss in the Brahman or the Paramatma. The bliss is in Bhag with Bhagavan. That's one point, right? Another yes, point is the form of the, this Brahman feature of the Lord is impersonal. Yes. So how can we have any devotion for something which is without personality? You cannot. You cannot have any devotion for something which is without personality. There's no question of worshipping Brahman. What about Paramatma? The problem with Paramatma is Paramatma is only here in the material world. Paramatma's function is here in the material world. There's no Paramatma in the spiritual world. When we go to the spiritual world, the Lord is there as Bhagavan. So Paramatma's relation, his function is only relates to the material realm. So limited. So we want to cultivate devotion, as you said, should be for the Bhagavan feature, which is com that will give us full bliss, and that is an eternal relationship, loving relationship. This is the meaning of real bhakti. Is it clear, everyone? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma okay, we'll go ahead. Maraji can read now. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes. It is stated in the Bhagavad Gita 7.23 that the worshippers of the demigod can go to the planet of demigods. The moon worshipper can go to moon. The sun worshippers no, to the no, sun, no. etc. I, I, I don't know. My text is different from this. Okay. Sorry, Maharaj. In the Bhagavad Gita 7.20.23, it is said that only unintelligent, bewildered persons driven by the strong desire for sense gratification worship the demigods for the temporary relief of temporary problems. Since the living being is materially entangled, he has to be revealed from material bondage okay. eternally to attain permanent relief on the spiritual plane where eternal bliss, life, and knowledge exist. Sri Ishopanishad therefore instructs that we should not seek temporary relief of our difficulties by worshipping the dependent demigods who can bestow only temporary benefits. Rather, we must worship the absolute personality of Godhead Krishna, who is all attractive and who can bestow upon us complete freedom from material bondage by taking us back to home, back to Godhead. Hare Krishna. So can the demigods take us back to Godhead? No. Why not? Uh, because they are in the material world and they do not have that uh, uh, capacity or they are not Bhagwan who can give us liberation. Yes. Well, can we worship them as a part of the Bhagavan?
A tricky question, eh? Uh, we should worship demi god but in relationship to the lord shri krishna yes right we can worship demi gods in relation to lord krishna if we worship them we have to understand how they are tiny part of lord krishna and so there are some devotees who did like that i think it was bharat maharaj that he was worshiping demi gods making offerings sacrifices to demi gods understanding them as a part of the supreme lord in the brihad bhagavatam rita by sanatana goswami i was just reading recently they mentioned there you can worship a blade of grass you can take a blade of grass and worship it understanding that the lord is there in the blade of grass so if you worship the demigods understanding that the lord is there in the heart of the demigods along with the jiva there's no harm you can do it but it's much easier to directly worship the supreme lord so the 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 failings of demigod worship is described here right what are some of the what are, what is the results of worshiping demigods maraji what do we get when we uh, in bhagavad gita 9.25 yanti deva vrata devan yanti those who worship the demigods, they go to their planet to worship to Pitaras, they go to there. And they who worship the ghosts, they go to their planets. And who worship me, they come to my abode. So what happens then if we go to demigod planets? We can enjoy them. We have perception. to come back again. We have to be in material world only. Okay. Generally, so what are the results of worshipping demigods? Only fruitive activity, material, temporary desires may be fulfilled. Right. So what kind of people worship the demigods? Artha, 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 Artha. Yeah, people who have material desires, right? People with material desires, they worship the demigod. Foolish, less intelligent people, less intelligent. They're described as alpa medashaha, small intelligence, small brain. Why? Because the results are limited and temporary. You're not going to get real benefit, no lasting benefit from worship of the demigod. But it's very easy to please the demigods. People may say, very easy to please the demigods. Very difficult to please Krishna. Very quick I can get results from the demigods. So, what will you say? Because demigods are doing their jobs. Duty. Duties. Krishna knows what and uh, maybe Lord Shri Krishna is like our mother who knows when and what my child will be needed. What is the best for my child? Yeah. Yes, uh, we have to understand. You may be able to please the demigods very easily. You can anger them also very easily. <laughs> yes. You be very careful. And demigods, they will give you blessings without thinking if it's actually good for you. But Lord Krishna, he will think very carefully. He won't give so quickly because he's thinking, is this really good for this person? Is this really going to help them? So, which is better? You approach someone who's more thoughtful, who's more caring, who really cares about us. Demigods, they just give you, they will just give the blessings. Oh, okay. He's worshiping me. Very good. Very happy. Yes, so be very cautious when you worship the devas. Okay, we'll go ahead. Another manager, please read. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes, Hare Krishna. It is stated in the Bhagavad Gita 7.2. Two, three, that the worshippers of the demigods can go to the planets of the demigods. The moon worshippers can go to the moon. 
the sun worshippers to the sun, etc. Modern scientists are now venturing to the moon with the help of rockets. But the, this is not really a new attempt. With their advanced consciousness, and to leave the planets, the spaceships. In the Vedic scriptures, it is said that one can reach other planets by any one of these three ways. The most common way is by worshiping a planet. In Something wrong there? Hare Hare Krishna, Krishna, Krishna. Hare Krishna. What happened? What happened? Connection problem, Maharaj. Okay. So someone else please continue reading. Hare Krishna Maharaj. With their yes, advanced sir. consciousness, human beings are naturally inclined to travel in outer space and to reach other planets either by spaceships, mystic powers, or demigod worship. In the Vedic scriptures, it is said that one can reach other planets by any one of these three ways. But the most common way is by worshipping the demigod presiding over a particular planet. In this way, one can reach the moon planet, the sun planet, and even Brahmaloka, the topmost planet in this universe. However, all planets in the material universe are temporary residences. The only permanent planets are the Vaikuntha Lokas. These are found in the spiritual sky, where the personality of Godhead himself predominates. As Lord Sri Krishna states in the Bhagavad Gita 8.16, A Brahma Bhuvana Loka Punaravartino Archana Ma Mupetitu Kaunteya Punar Janmana Vidyate. Hare Krishna. From the from the highest planet in the material world down to the lowest, all are places of misery wherein repeated birth and death take place. But one who attains my abode, O son of Kunti, never takes birth again. So is my Kunta the abode of the Lord? Yes, Maharaj. Uh, they come under the spiritual world, the permanent. But above the Vaikuntha planets, there is a Goloka, the Krishna planet. Okay, yeah, good. Yeah. And what about Brahmaloka? Where's that? Brahmaloka uh, is the highest uh, planet of these four, uh, 14 material worlds, the topmost one. And that also temporary, like it comes under material world. So Brahma also has a material body, is it? He yes. also died. Yes, Maharaj. He lives only 100 years. Okay. All right. Thank you. Very good. We'll go ahead. Yes, someone else can read, please. Sri Shopanishad. Hare Krishna, Mano. Yes, Hare Krishna. Shopanishad points out that one who worships the demigods and attains to their material planets still remains in the darkest region of the universe. The whole universe is covered by the gigantic material elements. It is just like a coconut covered by a shell and half filled with water. Since its covering is airtight, the darkness within is dense and therefore the sun and the moon are required for illumination. Outside the universe is the vast and unlimited Brahma Jyoti expansion which is filled with Vaikuntha Lokas. The biggest and highest planet in the Brahma Jyoti is Krishna Loka or Goloka Vrindavana where the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Shri Krishna himself, resides. Lord Shri Krishna never leaves Krishna Loka. Although he dwells there with his eternal associates, he is omnipresent throughout the complete material and spiritual cosmic manifestations. This fact has already been explained in Mantra 4. The Lord is present everywhere just like the sun, yet he is situated in one place just as the sun is situated in its own undeviating orbit. Hare Krishna. So can you tell us how is it the Lord is everywhere? How is it he's present everywhere? As Paramatma Maharaj. Okay, it's Paramatma. 
And, and uh, his, he never leaves Krishna Loka. But we heard that he comes in this world. He comes, you know, we hear Yada Yadahi Dharmashya, right? Yeah. So is, is that not Krishna who's coming? Yes, Maharaj, Krishna only in Virat room. <laughs> But it says he doesn't leave Krishna Loka, so how can he come here? He can, he's omnipotent. Huh? Is he's it Amaya Krishna who comes? Is it Amaya Krishna? Like I said, Ravan took Amaya Sita away. So maybe it's Amaya Krishna who comes here. No, no. Hmm? What happens? Same, yes. Krishna, same Krishna, Lord Krishna himself, he comes, Maharaj, because he is yes. omnipotent. Right. He is everywhere. Very good. Right. It's Krishna himself, he comes. That he, can ex he can be in Goloka, and at the same time, he can also come here if he wants. He has that power. Just like he married 16,100 queens, and he married them all at the same time. And he was sat, he sat in the fire yagya with each of them at the same time. And he went to each of their palaces. He would stay in each of their palaces with them. But then he would come out and 16,100 Krishnas would become again one Krishna and he would go to the Siddharma Sabha. So Krishna could do these things. You can expect, just like when Brahma stole away the cows and the cowherd boys. Krishna could become the cows and the cowherd boys. Krishna himself became the cows and the cowherd boys. So Krishna has that kind of potency. All right, so we're hearing about the universe. The universe is described to be like a coconut, right? Yes. How many coconuts are there in the material world? How many universes? 14 million. Hmm? Many are there. Yeah, know. unlimited. There's so unlimited, many. Unlimited. Unlimited. So many universes in the material world. And what's the portion of the what portion of the spiritual sky is the material world? Do you know? Three fourth marriage. Yes. One fourth and the rest is uh, right. spiritual. Material world is one fourth, right? The spiritual world is three fourth. So this universe is very dark. It's yes. like a coconut, inside the coconut, very dark. So where do we get light from? Sun and moon, Maharaj. From the sun and the moon? Where, where does the sun get the light from? From uh, Lord himself, Krishna. From, the, from Krishna's effulgence, right? From a joy tea. Yeah. And that's a, in, the, in the form of the sun. And then the moon is the reflection of the sun. And this way... Okay, the highest planets, and so you've got the Vaikuntha, the spiritual world. Okay, very good. We heard about Mantra 4. What, what was it said in Mantra 4? Do you remember what we studied? Yeah. Um, uh, Krishna, Lord Krishna stays in his own planet, Krishna Loka. Mantra but, 4. Yeah. So, uh, even yes. demons cannot reach him, and he is uh, faster than our mind. Yes, right. Yes, swifter than the mind. He can yeah. overcome all of the all others running. Mm. People are running, but they can't catch him. We Just like uh, when Krishna was fighting Jarasandha and Kalasambhav, that Kalasambhav he came running after Krishna. Right. Krishna. Krishna got the name Ranchur because he left the battlefield. And that Kalasambhav came after running after Krishna. He couldn't catch him. Hmm. And then he got, Krishna went in the cave and he got burned to ashes by, who was it? Who was laying there sleeping? Hmm. Woke him up. Muchikunda. Muchikunda, yes. Very good. 
Okay, well, go ahead. Uh, come back to the men to read the problems of life. Some men. The problems of the life cannot be solved simply by going to the moon planet or some other planet above or below it. Therefore, Sri Ishwanipra advises us not to bother with any destination within the dark material universe, but to try to get out of it and reach to the affluent kingdom of God. There may be, there are many pseudo worshippers who become religion, religionist only for the sake of the name and fame. Such pseudo religionists do not wish to get out of the universe and reach the spiritual spiritual sky spiritual sky the on, the they only want to maintain the status quo in the material world under the grab of worshiping the lord the atheist uh, the atheist and the impersonalist leads such foolish pseudo religionists into the darkest really, uh, regions by preaching the cult of atheism the atheist directly denies the existence of the supreme personality of godhead and the impersonality supports the atheist by the stressing the impersonalist aspect of the Supreme Lord. Thus far, we have not come across uh, any mantra in Sri Iso Krishna in which the Supreme Personality of Godhead is denied. It is said that it is said that he can run faster than anyone. Those who are those who are running after other planets are certainly a person. If the Lord can run faster than all of them, can he be impersonal? The impersonal conception of the Supreme Lord is another form of ignorance arising from the imperfect <laughs> conception of the absolute truth. Thank you, Prabhu. Okay. So Prabhupada is giving us some arguments here against the uh, atheistic philosophers because you know, atheism is very prominent in the world today. Even though we're preaching Krishna consciousness and trying to distribute books, we come across a lot of atheism. Even when you go to universities and colleges, you have to confront atheists, big atheists. They even have atheistic society. Just like we have our Bhakti Yoga society, they have their atheist society. So we're trying to explain to people the reality of life. They're trying to solve the problems of the world by their technology. Prabhupada talks about them going to the moon. Did they go to the moon? Did they, did they go to the moon? What no matter. They, what did they bring back? What, what did they say they brought back from the moon? moon sand yeah they brought some rocks yeah some rocks from the moon they said that's what they said anyway they said they brought some rocks from the moon yeah we don't believe that you know, they went to the moon but you know even if they did what good did it do they didn't do any good you can get anywhere didn't learn anything so how should you go if you want to go to the moon how do you go what is the proper way to go How should you go to the moon? Just worship the moon god. Yeah, that's one way. You can worship the moon god. Right? The moon is a higher planet. So, pious activities. You want to go to the moon planet or the sun planet, you have to do a lot of pious activities by pi material piety. You can go there. As you say, worship the moon god or worship the sun god. Like that, you can go to the moon. But is it going to get us very far? It's not going to solve the problem of life. Because you're still in the material world. So Prabhupada said, Ishapanishad says, don't bother with that. Don't waste your time. Try to get out of this material world. Don't just try to be comfortable in the world. Prabhupada gives an example, just like the man is in the prison. He should think how to get out of the prison. 
He shouldn't want to just try to be comfortable in the prison. He should think how to get out. So Prabhupada talks about these two philosophers, atheism and impersonalism. Both big foolish people. So we're preaching, how, we, how can we defeat them? We're preaching the message of Lord Chaitanya, trying to overcome this. Prabhupada says that <laughs> the, preaching the cult of atheism, the pseudo-religionists preach the cult of atheism. Yeah, they actually make, they try to make propaganda against God. They tell people, don't be so foolish. Why should you believe in God? You never saw him. He's not there. Nobody ever saw him. So the atheists, they directly deny the existence of God. And the impersonalists, they support the atheists. Because they're saying, what, what are the impersonalists saying? What is their, why do they support the atheism? Someone tell me. According to the Hare Krishna Maharaj, according to them, Lord do not have a form. So they yeah, are against the Lord. So, so they say, what is the absolute then? And their, and their understanding, what is the absolute? Uh, Brahma Jyoti. Yeah, the Brahman, simply Brahman, right? The impersonal Brahman, right? They're thinking God has no form. So this is also another form of atheism. And the same with Buddhism. What do the Buddhists say? The, the Buddhists don't say Buddha's God. They don't say that. Buddhists will never say Buddha's God. They say Buddha's Buddha. He's not man, he's not God, he's Buddha. So what, what do the Buddhists teach? They will simply teach what? Do you know? What is voidism. It? Voidism, right. That you're, you're not real. The world is not real. Nothing is real. So, what should you do? Right? If everything is void, then what should you do? Anybody can say? What are you going to do? Everything is void, so? What should you do? Hare Krishna Maharaj, I can just try. We can be in peace. Just be in peace. <laughs> yeah, you don't do anything, right? Sit, neti, neti. Do nothing. Neti even something. Yeah, nothing. Because everything is not real. Nothing is real. You're not real. You don't exist. You go to a Buddhist temple, they have a dead body there. You sit and look at the dead body. They say, this is, oh, this is the end. This is reality. Just simply the dead body. Nothing is real. So they sit and they meditate like that. The meditation, you go in a Buddhist temple, they have pictures of skeletons on the, on the temple wall. They don't put pictures of Krishna or Buddha. They put pictures of a skeleton. They meditate on this is what we are. We're just simply these bones. We're like it. Listen, everything is void, nothing is real. So don't do anything, just sit and meditate. That's all they do. You go to a Buddhist temple for a retreat, meditate. Meditation, and then maybe lunch, take a little lunch, and then again, meditation. <laughs> you know, this is their program. Nothing, don't talk to anybody. Don't come here, don't talk to people, just sit and be quiet. Prabhu said peace, right? Peace. They think that is peace. They do not know what is real peace. The mind is still there. The mind is still active. Where is the peace? We have our own formula for peace in Bhagavad Gita. That is it. But what they think, they're, they're, they trick themselves into thinking peace. Okay, so atheism, impersonalism, all of these things we we're trying to preach against by preaching the message of Lord Chaitanya. So Prabhupada said this impersonalism, another ignorance. Go ahead, please read. Marriage is again. 
Who has not read? Hare Krishna. The ignorant pseudo religionist and the manufacturers of so called incarnations who directly violate the Vedic injunctions are liable to enter into the darkest region of the universe because they mislead those who follow them. These impersonalists generally pose themselves as incarnations of God to foolish persons who have no knowledge of Vedic wisdom. If such foolish men have any knowledge at all, it is more dangerous in their hands than ignorance, ignorance itself. Such impersonalists do not even worship the demigods according to the scriptural recommendations. In the scriptures, there are recommendations for worshipping demigods under certain circumstances, but at the same time, these scriptures state that there is normally no need for this. In the Bhagavad Gita 7.23, it is clearly stated that the results derived from worshipping the demigods are not permanent. Since the entire material universe is impermanent, whatever is achieved within the darkness of material existence is also impermanent. The question is how to obtain real and permanent life. Okay. Thank you, Mariji. So, yeah, can you tell me what is this? They manufacture incarnations of God. How do they do this? Do they, they go to the factory or something? The Prabhupada said they're manufacturing incarnations of God. Some people will act as they are the gods. I mean, Okay. They claim they claim they to claim be that they are the, they are the incarnation of the God. And what how do they support their claim? Some magic they will show. Maybe some magic show, yeah. Yeah, good. Yeah, if you go to Kumbha Mela, when there's a Kumbha Mela, you often see many incarnations of God. They are, or at least their followers are giving out pamphlets, come and meet the incarnation of God, Kali Yuga Avatar. But Prabhupada explains these people are usually impersonalists. He said they're more dangerous. Why are they more dangerous than ignorance? Because uh... These people are claiming that they are God, so the uh, innocent people will believe in them and they will lead them into a wrong path. So yeah. these people are more dangerous. Yeah. Foolish men have no knowledge at all. You get people, they come and they will preach. They'll say things like, oh, it's all right to eat fish. Fish is the fruit of the sea. So people hear this, they think, oh, very good. I can eat fish. I love fish. I'm so glad to hear I can eat fish. Right? So you get people like that. They become very popular because they support fish eating. And then so many other bogus philosophies they will teach. They will teach that God is a poor man. God is not God is not Bhagavan. God is the poor man. The Ridranarain. He's a poor man in the street. Only the poor men are God. The rich men, they're not God. And God is not God. But the poor man, he's become God. This, this is what this is the kind of nonsense that is being taught. So it's very dangerous because misleading people, giving people the wrong ideas. And Prabhupada explained, when they, even when they worship the demigods, they don't do it properly. They don't do it according to the scriptures. Just like in the scriptures it says, you want to eat meat? There's a process to do it. Right? You want to eat meat? You have to go before Goddess Kali on the dark moon night. 
Dark moon night means once in the month. So once in the month, you go in front of Goddess Kali and you tell the goat, I'm going to kill you. In the future, you can kill me. That's it. That's it. what you have to say. You have to, there's a mantra like that. I'm going to kill you because I want to eat the meat. You can, in the future, you can kill me. So this is what they're supposed to do if they want to eat meat. Of course, nowadays people, they don't, they just kill and they eat. So very sinful. So material world is very temporary. Whatever is achieved is also temporary. So how to get real life, we're going to hear now. Yes, let's have another man read. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Hare, Hare Krishna Prabhu. The Lord states that as soon as one reaches him by the devotional service, which is one, or, one and only way to approach the personality of a Godhead, one attains complete freedom from the bondage of birth and death. In other words, the path of salvation from material clutches fully depend on the principles of knowledge and detachment gained from serving the Lord. The pseudo-religionists have neither knowledge nor detachment from material affairs, for most of them want to live in the golden Shackle. shackles of material bondage under the shadow of philanthropic activities disguised as religious principles. By a fa false display of religious sentiments, they present a show of devotional service while indulging in all uh, sort of immoral activities. In this way, they pass as spiritual masters and devotees of God. Such violators of religious principle have no respect for the authoritative acharyas, the holy teachers in the strict discipline successions. They ignore the Vedic injections Acharyo Acharyo Pasana one must worship the Acharya and Krishna's statement in Bhagavad Gita 4.2 Evam Parampara Praptam this, this supreme science of God is received through the disciplic succession. Instead to mislead the people in general, they themselves become so-called Acharyas, but they do not even follow the principles of the Acharyas. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Thank you. There's some important points here. Uh, so, like few of the uh, non devotees, they means those who are, uh, they are not into any sampradayas. Uh, they follow their own uh, uh, means own concrete theory, and they they be, they become as an acharya and they do the preaching for others, which is not, uh, which is not from anywhere uh, in the disciplic successions. Yes, right. You don't care for the disciplic succession. Okay, so as soon as one reaches him by devotional service, Prabhupada said, it's the only way to approach God. Yeah. You have to, he's only approached by devotion. There's no other path, not by karma, not by jnana, not by yoga, only by devotion. Now this is, and this way, then we can actually find the way out of the will of birth and death. So then Prabhupada talks about the principle of devotion uh, to get out of this material world depends on the principles of knowledge and detachment. In other words, gyan and vairag. And then we get this gyan and vairag. How do you, how do, where does it come from? Uh, from the disciplic succession, from the acharya, basically from spiritual master. Well, we get it from serving, That's from doing good. service, by doing bhakti yoga. Where there is real bhakti, there will also be knowledge and detachment. The example is given in Srimad Bhagavatam. That just like when a hungry man eats food, when he eats food, he will also feel relief from hunger, and he will feel satisfaction and nourishment 
and strengthen his body. It all comes about as he goes on eating. So in the same way, when one is actually doing devotional service, the results of devotional service should manifest. And they manifest there in the form of the awakening of transcendental knowledge and also detachment from the material existence. So these two things, Gyan and Vairag, are like the sons of devotion. They're like the two children of devotion. So we don't have to separately acquire these things. We just simply have to practice devotion. We do our devotional service. We hear and we chant and we offer worship. And just by doing these things, we automatically develop, awaken transcendental knowledge about the Lord and about his existence and the nature of this world and the spiritual world. And we will also cultivate this detachment from whatever has no connection to Krishna. We lose our interest in the mundane. How much we're advancing in Krishna consciousness can be understood by how much we have lost our interest in the mundane, in the mundane things of life. How much are you still interested in the cricket results or the football scores or the politics or the stock market? All these things, right? The detachment comes about simply by serving Krishna. So the pseudo-religionists, Prabhupada talks, what do they do? They work under the shadow of philanthropic activities. In other words, they like to do some social work and people think, oh, very good, they're helping the people. And it's disguised as some religious principle. So they make a show like this. Yeah? feeding the poor, doing welfare activities, you build a, a home or a hospital or a school. But this, these activities are material. They're not actually spiritual activities. Spiritual activities mean simply hearing, chanting, serving the Lord. So this is what we learn from the act, from the spiritual authorities. So Prabhupada talks, some people, they pose as the acharyas, they pose as spiritual masters. Because the important principle is acharya pasana. You have, we have to worship the acharyas. Just like you see in our temples, every day we do Prabhupada Guru Puja. That is acharya pasana. And people who go to Mongol Arti, sometimes they criticize us. They say, oh, it's ISKCON, they just worship the Guru. Yeah, the first thing is they worship the Guru. And then we worship Krishna. So we, be, we begin that Mongol Arti, offering worship to the Guru. And then we worship Radha Madhava. Then we worship Panchatattva, like that. But first thing is to worship the Guru. Because from the Guru, we got the knowledge. But they, these people, these so-called acharyas, they mislead them. They say, just worship me. No need to worship God. No need to keep pictures of God. You just keep my picture there. They will tell them like that. The position of the guru. Right? The guru himself has become everything. No, it's not like that. The guru himself is a humble servant, insignificant servant of the Lord. Okay, so where are we? Okay, these robes. Yes. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes. These robes are the most dangerous element in human society because there is no religious government. They escape punishment by the law of the state. They cannot, however, escape the law of the Supreme, who has clearly declared in Bhagavad Gita that envious demons in the grab of religious propagandists shall be thrown into the darkest region of hell. Bhagavad Gita 16, 19 to 20. So the Ishwabhinesh confirmed that these pseudo religions are heading towards the most obnoxious place in the universe 
after the completion of their spiritual master business which they conduct simply for sense gratification okay so it's a very powerful statement here by shila prophet at the end of this mantra <laughs> so warning the results of this uh, these kind of activities these pseudo religionists in other words they're not actual religionists but pretending to be the false false religionists and so they're thrown into the darkest region of hell so very dangerous situation so we have to be able to recognize these things we have to see that the uh, we have to know what is where is the genuine process and where is the false process but ordinary people are not trained they don't know and they will simply judge who has got a lot of followers are they doing welfare work are they doing charity they look like that. they look at material things they don't hear how how we should actually understand by hearing hearing the message of their charity that's important all right any questions anybody otherwise we can go on because we're supposed to cover two mantras today hari krishna maharaj yes prabhu uh, maharaj uh, we know that uh, spiritual sky there is a goloka and uh, other planets is planetary systems planets uh like dwarka and all uh, vaikuntha but the uh here in the material world the garbhodakshai vishnu he is present so how to understand this is also a spiritual world yes if you have that well krishna is everywhere you can say so for for the pure devotee he sees everywhere is a spiritual world he doesn't see any difference between this or that because everywhere he sees krishna so that is the thinking of the uttama adhikari he can see the lord everywhere in everything so he doesn't need to go anywhere He's, you know for those who've taken shelter of lord narayan there's no difference between heaven and hell and liberation it's all the same because wherever he goes he sees the lord and he's going to engage in devotional service wherever you put him prabhupad gives the example he said just like you have that machine for threshing the rice when they harvest the rice they put the rice in the, will knock off the kernels so that machine wherever you have it you have it in north india or south india or you take it to the moon it's still going to do the same work so he said devotee is like that wherever you put him business is the same chanting hari krishna read bhagavad gita worship krishna because you see everywhere krishna and krishna service so oh, there's no difference right garba daksha vishnu is here in the universe shiro daksha vishnu is also here everywhere expanded everywhere in everyone's heart and every atom so everything shankara acharya took the statement sarvam kavidam brahma everything is brahman yes everything is spirit it's true everything is spirit but there's a supreme brahman right para brahman krishna is the para brahman we worship the para brahman so garba dakshai vishnu karana dakshai vishnu shiro dakshai vishnu they are the purusha avatars but krishna is the swayam bhagavan you see the worship that there's some difference between the worship of lord narayan or vishnu and the worship of krishna why is it you know what's so special about krishna why want to go to krishna why not just worship lord narayan if you read the brihad bhagavatam rita sanatan goswami's book you know he describes about gopkumar 
how he went to Vaikuntha. He went to Vaikuntha and he met Lord Narayan. But it wasn't so fulfilling for him because he was thinking about Vrindavan and he was thinking how when he meditates in Vrindavan, he meditates on Madangopal and Lord Madangopal embraces him and they joke together and they're very friendly. But when you go to Vaikuntha, Lord Narayan, the mood is more Aishwarya. So the worship of Vishnu is Vaidhi, Vaidhi Bhakti. But the worship of Krishna is more Braja Bhakti. It's more Raganuga Bhakti. Spontaneous devotion. So it's, there's some very special experiences which the devotees who worship Lord Krishna enjoy in the worship of Krishna, enjoy in their dealings with Krishna, which you don't get in the worship of Garbhodakashayi Vishnu. You know, you may worship Lord Vishnu, but it's not like worshiping Krishna because the mood is Aishwarya, opulence. Everybody is very respectful, very, you know, and the Lord, he's up on a big throne, he's above everyone, you know, and everybody is worshipping him. So the mood of Vaikuntha is all Dasharas. You don't get Vasalyaras or Sakyaras there or Madhuryaras. It's not there in Vaikuntha. That's only in Goloka. So you want to experience the, the higher rasas. You have to worship Krishna. You have to cultivate Braja Bhakti. Lakshmi, the goddess of fortune, she wanted to experience loving relationship with Krishna. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu went down to Trichy and he met with the Sri Vaishnavas there. And he was joking with them. He said, you know, you know, Lakshmi is a very chaste woman. She's very faithful to her husband, Lord Narayan. But why did she want to go with Krishna? So the Sri Vaishnava Balababata, he said to Lord Chaitanya, he said, oh, please. <coughs> Excuse me. He said, Stop joking with me. You know Lakshmi is a very chaste lady. Lord Krishna is not different from Lord Narayan. They're the same. So Chaitanya Mahaprabhu said, yes, right. There's no difference. But why then did Lakshmi go to Vrindavan and she did austerities? Why did she go to Vrindavan and do austerities? She did this because she wanted to join Rasa Lila. She wanted to dance with Krishna and Rasa Lila, but she could not. Even though she did her austerities and Vrindavan, she did not get the opportunity to join the Rasa Lila. The Rasa, the Rasa, the Rasa, the Rasa, Why not? Why not? Because she's the goddess of fortune, she couldn't give up her opulences. She couldn't just become a cowherd woman in Vrindavan. You want to join Rasa Lila? First, you have to become a gopi. Then you can be qualified. Hare Krishna, are we still in connection? Yes, Maharaj. Okay. So this should be understood. There's a difference worshipping Krishna and worshipping Garbhodakshayi Vishnu. There's very special dealings between Krishna and his devotees, which are not there between Vishnu and his devotees. And that's why people are more attracted to worship the Lord there. Okay. Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you, Maharaj. All right. So, uh, 
we've been speaking about uh, maybe we should have a little revision what we covered so far. The first section. Well, first of all, we had the invocation mantra. Have you all learned that invocation mantra? Yes, Om Purnamada Purnamida Purnasya Purnamadaya Purnamiva Neva Vasishati. So we spoke about the Lord as Purnam, right? Purnam meaning? Complete. 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 Perfect. Completely perfect, right? Perfect and complete. And the example is? What the example is given in the verse? Even though so many complete units emanate from him, still he remains complete. Here, he remains a complete balance. Yes, he still even though so many universes are coming from him, he still remains complete, the complete balance. So that is the unique nature of the Supreme Lord. Then we went on to the first section, the first three mantras. Uh, the first mantra particularly very important. Isavashyam Isavashyam Idam Sarvam. Jagatim Jagat Yes, meaning. What is the summary of this understanding? Everything any animates and animates that is within this universe is controlled and owned by the Lord. Therefore then we should accept whatever the things necessary for uh, ourselves. And we should uh, not, uh, our quota, we should accept only our quota. Right, we should take our quota. Not, and not take more than that. Why? Because it's not belongs to us actually, it belongs to the right. Supreme Lord. Because it doesn't belong to us, it's not ours, there's no right. Yes, just, so just take what we need. What is sufficient? That's given to us. That is the important point. And if we go, if we work in that way, then what will happen? If we do like that, what is the result? A karma. It will become a karma. Yes. And you do a karma, then what will happen? Hundred years you can live. Yeah, you live a long life. Long. Yeah, live a long life. Very good. Yes. So, what kind of society is that where people recognize God as the proprietor? What is the term? Ishavasya. Ishavasya. Ishavasya society, right? God center. Ishavasya, meaning God center. God right? center. Yes, good. Okay. So, and then we went on to hear what happens when people don't work like that? But what's the result? They will go to hell. And they will. Uh... Yeah, right. They enter into darkness and ignorance. Right? Can the soul be killed? Oh, Maharaj. Atmaha. <laughs> what is Atmaha meaning? A killer of the soul. So, what can you explain to me the meaning? Killer of the soul. What's what's happening? If, if we are if we are not doing uh, Isha Vasya principle, that means we are the uh, indirectly we are the killer of the soul. Yes, right. Because we are denying the interest of the soul, the need of the soul. Okay, very good. So we will stop here and we'll meet this evening again. We'll continue.
Thank you very much, Srila Prabhupada Ki. Yeah. His Holiness Bhakti Vigna Vinasa Rasima Swami Maharaj Ki. Yeah. Prabhupada Maharaj Ki. Yeah. Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you, Maharaj.